Hey guys, today I'm playing Kerbal Space Program for the first time in years, and my plan is to land on Duna, which is the Mars analog in the Kerbal universe. I'm hoping to somewhat scientifically plan my route there and not just YOLO it, but let's see how it goes. So I just started out here in the space center, and loaded up the vehicle assembly building, and started making a rocket. So the first thing I did was picked this cockpit, and there weren't a lot of reasons for this. I'd say the biggest one was that it fits this liquid fuel tank, which is a good size for my final stage, and also it has a nose cone built in basically, which just makes it pretty convenient. So I used this engine for my final stage, which is the little dart engine. You can see it's just really small. The things I like about it is that it's light. I'm pretty sure it's efficient. I'm not actually sure of that. And I've used it before in the past with this fuel tank, and I know with this cockpit as well, it's definitely capable of just being a good final stage. It has a ton of delta V for its size, and it just works out well. So the next thing I'm putting on is some landing gear, like this, and it's going to be good for landing. There's a lot of times I've forgotten to put on landing gear and I've had to land on my wings, which the wings I'm putting on now. It's never a good time because the wings are not nearly as strong as the landing gear. So it's just nice to have the landing gear as well. So after I put those on, I put in a stack decoupler, and this is going to attach this last stage to the second stage of the rocket. I'm not going to build the second stage now, but I did just want to put in the decoupler since I was already on that screen. So the next thing I did was put in the ladder. This ladder is going to be used for the Kerbals to get in and out of the spacecraft. I wasn't actually sure if I was going to need this, but it doesn't really weigh anything for me to just throw on just in case, so that's just why I put it there. Now what I did is put in a tri-stack coupler, I'm pretty sure it's this name at least, to the bottom of the rocket, and this is going to be for attaching the second stage. There's going to be three engines and then a bunch of fuel tanks on them. Again, I wasn't working on the second stage yet, but I was already on that page, so before I lost it, I just decided to put that on. Next thing I'm putting on is a bunch of lights, and these, similar to the ladder, I didn't think were going to be necessary, but occasionally I will land on something at night, and it's super nice to have these, because otherwise it's like impossible to see where the ground is. Now putting on some solar panels, I decided on three, for no other reason than I thought it would look cool in space. These are going to have a few purposes. The one is for powering the lights, but the lights actually take very little power, and the bigger use is going to be for charging this battery, which, okay, what's the battery going to be used for? So the battery is going to be used for the SAS module, which is the stabilization, which keeps it from rotating in any direction, or it will rotate the rocket in any direction if you want it to rotate. The next thing I wanted to put on was parachutes. I forgot to put these on in the past before, and it has definitely ruined flights. So these small parachutes I'm putting on, I put on the SAS module. They blend in a little bit too well, actually. I wish I put them a bit lower. These are going to be for the upper atmosphere for the initial slowdown, and these bigger parachutes get the rocket down to a speed where it can actually land. After I got those parachutes put in place, I decided to start working on the second stage of the rocket. So for this I actually used the same fuel tanks I used for the first stage, but just a lot more of them. So this time I have nine tanks overall, but there's three different sections that each have three. And at the bottom of all these stacks, I'm going to be putting vector engines. Now I love using vector engines, mainly because I know how they work. They produce a ton of thrust. And also they can vector around uh, quite a bit, they have a large swivel range, so this allows them to be very maneuverable in the air. Now really that's all I had for stage 2, and I wanted to work on the first stage of the rocket. And to start this off, I put on some radial decouplers like this, and then on them I'm putting some solid rocket boosters. Now I've never actually used these specific boosters before, but they're solid fuel boosters, and what that means is once you turn them on, you literally cannot turn them off. Now this is fine for a first stage of the rocket when I'm just trying to get out of the atmosphere, because then they'll just burn up until I get out, and then they just fall away and it's fine. But in space, these would be horrible, because once you turn them on, you can't have any fine control over your orbit. It would just go crazy. So I had to start putting on some wings, and I put on these really large wings in the bottom. I'm not actually sure how useful they are, but they look pretty cool, so that's why I went with them. And then in stage 2, I just put a bunch of these little wings, and I thought it looked fine enough. So finally, I had to put on the holder mechanism thingies to hold on to the rocket, and once I had that, I just named it, and sent it to the launch pad. So I started off and realized immediately I had made a big, big mistake, because I didn't properly stage anything, so everything was just going to go off at the wrong time, so I just took the opportunity to basically just test out the rocket. So I sent the first stage, seems fine, sent off the first stage here, went up fine, and then... The second stage just fell away, and I was left with just the final stage. So it was close to working, except the second stage was just being completely ignored. So also I took the opportunity to test out the parachutes, and these seemed to work perfectly fine. So I just restaged everything in the editor again, and just looked at everything. So it starts off with the holders letting go, and then the solid rocket fuel boosters start going up, and then once those are used up, the radial decouplers attach to them, let go of those boosters, then we're just left with the second stage. The vector engines go on the bottom, and after all of its liquid fuel is used up, the top stage decouples, and then finally the dart engine goes. So that bring it to the launch pad again, I decide to turn on the stabilization in the bottom, and let it go. So it started off fine, the clamps let go of the rocket, and the booster started going up. Now this part of the launch is just going straight up, there's no turning yet or anything, we just need to gain a bunch of height. So that's just what I'm doing, 
And you can see there's a lot of drag on the rocket right now. All that those white lines are just drag lines. So once I got up to about 10,000 meters, I began turning. And normally this is way too low, but I thought this rocket was going to be very unmaneuverable and was going to finish this at like 30,000 meters. Turned out though, this thing was way better than I thought. And by the time I was done turning, it was only about 20,000 meters. Now, this might sound good, but it's actually kind of a massive problem, because now I'm stabilizing my orbit way too low, and the max height of my orbit is still going to be within the atmosphere, so there's going to be a ton of drag, and you can see here all of these red lines are just drag lines. I'm pretty sure these red lines are a glitch, everything else though is just drag lines. So I decided to live with it, if I needed to try a launch again, I totally could, but for now things seem to be okay. So I let go of the boosters, and for the most part that seemed to be okay, except they exploded, but they seem to just explode themselves and not my second stage or the final stage, so things should be fine. And when I went into the large view here, I realized my big fear was true, and the max height of my orbit was only 47,000 meters, which is way lower than it needed to be. The max height of the atmosphere, I'm pretty sure, is 70,000 meters, so I needed to be above that in order to get a stable orbit. So that was sort of a problem, but I decided it was probably okay. So what I did is went all the way up to basically the top of my orbit, that apoapsis, and then started burning again. And this burn is going to be used to circularize the orbit and get it to go all the way around uh, Kerbin in this case. I'm going to keep calling it Earth though. So I burned for a little bit and then the apoapsis actually got further away from me. Now you don't have to burn at that maximum height, but once you start burning more and create a circular orbit, that maximum height is actually going to become the minimum height. And I would rather have that minimum height be as high up in the atmosphere as possible to prevent drag as much as I can. And once I was close enough, I started burning. And this time I actually did get a circular orbit around the Earth. So the maximum orbit is 106,000 meters, which is above the atmosphere, so that's fine. But it was sort of a game of once I get all the way around, am I still going to be above the atmosphere? Because there's going to be a bunch of drag, which is going to slow me down. So the maximum height might actually fall. Now I didn't think it was going to fall 30,000 meters, but I was curious to see how much it was going to fall. So this part of the orbit, I'm just going all the way around Kerbin, and I want to get to that maximum height. And finally, once I got there, I turned my rocket to be prograde, which means it's facing the direction that it's traveling, and then I started burning again. And now here I got the minimum of the orbit finally above 100,000 meters, which means this orbit is totally stable. So it was definitely a mistake for me to turn way faster than I did. I think it may have been those solid rocket fuel boosters having the gimbling on the bottom, Allowing it to move over to the side, it, I think it turned me too quickly. I think that may have actually hurt me in this case. But I did get my stable orbit, so the next step was to set Duna as the target and begin figuring out how I'm going to burn there. Now that I'm in a stable orbit, the next thing to do is somehow get the Zuna. Now I'm sure there are a lot of guys to do this, but I thought it'd be fun to derive it myself. If you want to see me start my next burn, you can just jump to the time on screen now. But otherwise, I'll explain how I figured out where and when I need to burn in order to get an encounter with Duna. The main idea of what I need to do is increase my orbital speed around Kerbin until I reach the escape velocity, where then I'll be orbiting around the sun. Once I'm free from Kerbin's gravity, I need to burn even more so that my orbit at its greatest extent is just touching Duna's orbit. The only issue with doing this right now is that when I end up on the other side of the sun and I'm on top of Duna's orbit, there's no guarantee that Duna's going to be there. I need to time my escape from Kerbin such that when I arrive at the point touching Duna's orbit, Duna is there as well to capture my spacecraft. To make this a little more mathematical, when the time that it takes me to get around the other side of the sun and the time that it takes Duna to reach the same location are equal, then this is when I need to begin burning. The speed at which Duna moves and its orbital radius are on the Kerbal Wiki, so that's going to be pretty helpful. My spacecraft though has a really odd orbit, and we need to solve for its orbital period, or the time that it takes to orbit the Sun. Fortunately, there's a great equation called Kepler's Third Law that's basically perfect. If you take the period of the orbit cubed over the radius to the orbit squared, it ends up being a constant. This constant is the same for everything orbiting the same object, which is in this case the Sun. Since we know the average orbital radius of Duna and the period from the Wiki, we can find what the constant is. We can use this to find the period of our spaceship, but we don't know what the radius is. In fact, radius is kind of a terrible word considering our orbit is literally an oval. The radius here is referring to the semi-major axis, which sounds really complicated, but it's just the average of the closest and furthest distances the spaceship is from the sun. These are the periapsis and apoapsis respectively, which are shown in the game. By averaging them, we get this number. Finally, we can plug this into Kepler's equation from earlier and find that the orbital period must be this long. Now we could have just saved the game, immediately set the spaceship around the sun, measured how long it took to orbit, and then just reloaded the game from before we did that, but you can't save and reload in real life unfortunately, and I guess I'm pretending to be realistic. So we had the period of the orbit, and we need to find the amount of time it takes to get around to the other side of the sun. If we were starting from any other point but here and here, 
This would be tremendously hard and likely require calculus, but since we're at one of these easy points, we can just divide the period in two and call it a day. Now this is where I'm going to start making some assumptions. I know the minimum and maximum orbital speeds of Duna from the Kerbal Wiki, and they're close enough to each other, I'm just going to assume that Duna is orbiting perfectly circularly around the Sun, and is always moving at a constant speed. This means I could take the average speed and multiply it by the time we calculated earlier to solve for the distance Duna will travel in the time that it takes me to wrap around the Sun. Now we're basically done, and all that's left to do is figure out what angle Duna will be at when it's this distance from the encounter. We can just use the circumference of the orbit to find the total length of the orbit, and then find the percentage of the orbit that Duna will need to be behind by. Converting this percentage to degrees, we get an angle of 170 degrees. Plus or minus, like, 10 degrees. The assumptions we made about Duna being perfectly circular are really not that great, but it's probably good enough. So for those of you that are joining back, basically what I'm doing now is just waiting for the opportunity that Duna is at just the right spot that once I expand my orbit, I'll end up getting an encounter with it. Now I figured out that was going to be about 135 degrees, somewhere in that range, and here I ended up just playing with the warp just enough and I ended up getting it to the angle that I wanted. So I made a quick save just in case something went wrong but the angle was alright, and once I did that I zoomed in to the Earth and started to expand my orbit. So my first thought was to do this at the periapsis, which I thought was going to be the most efficient spot to escape from, but it was actually the least efficient spot to escape from in this case. Now the problem is that the periapsis was on the wrong side of the Earth, so when I was expanding my orbit like I am here, I did get an escape, but the escape was on the wrong side of the Earth, so I just killed a ton of my speed going around the sun, which I was going to need to regain anyways. So basically by doing this, it doesn't ruin the mission, but it cost me a ton of rocket fuel that actually could have caused some problems. So the next thing to do is set up a maneuver node right on top of me, and basically what I'm doing is just expanding the orbit to get it right on top of Duna's orbit, so that they'll have an intersection point right at the top of their orbits. And once I eventually made that, I got my rocket facing the right direction, and then started the burn. And about halfway through the burn, I ended up running out of rocket fuel in stage 2, and I had to start using stage 3. I really didn't plan for this, I was hoping to use stage 3 only for when I got to Duna, so I was going to be missing a good chunk of fuel, and it's almost certainly because of my mistakes I made by escaping Kerbin from the wrong side. Now you'll see these two blue tick marks, and what these represent is the closest encounter that Duna and my spacecraft will have. Now, the fact that they're like that and it doesn't show an encounter means I'm not getting an encounter, because they're too far apart. They're really close though, which is a good thing. Now I thought it may have actually been that there's an encounter, it's just so far in the future or something that the game's getting a little confused. I didn't think that was the case, but it may have been. So I decided to hold out. And also, I wanted to fix my eccentricity, because right now I'm on a different plane than Duna by just a little bit, so by going to the ascending node, and then burning normally, which means I'm burning straight up and down, uh, with reference to the plane that I'm orbiting, I end up having a ascending node of 0.0, .0 degrees, which means I'm basically on the exact same plane as Duna. Now, I was hoping that this would end up fixing my encounter a little bit, it didn't, and you can see here, they're actually very far apart from each other. And just for fun, I tried to see if I could even see Duna. I'm not sure if this was it here in the sky. It may have been, it also may have just been that there's a red star in the background, but it was in about the right spot, and it seemed like it was going to be about by distance away. So I just reloaded my quick save from before I did my big orbit, and this is because I was actually behind Duna, which meant that Duna was too early, so I needed to warp just a little bit further in the future to have Duna be a little bit later. And then once I did that, I also went to the periapsis to start expanding my orbit again, because at the time, I didn't realize what a big mistake I had made by doing this. I only realized it later in the flight when I was wondering why I had so much less fuel than I was expecting. So once again, I just went to the periapsis, expanded my orbit, and started flying away from the Earth. And then finally I got to the escape point, and now I was orbiting around the Sun. So just like before, I turned prograde, which means that now I'm facing the direction that I'm traveling, and started burning again to once again increase my speed. So just like before, I didn't have enough fuel, so I had to dip into the third stage. And now you can see how close these nodes are together. And just by increasing the speed enough, I eventually got an encounter with Duna. So at this point, there's pretty much nothing left to do but just wait. I had about 200 something days to go all the way around the sun and eventually meet up with Duna. So that's basically all I did. And then once I got there, I was looking out for Duna and I couldn't quite see it. So I warped a little bit further in the future. And while I was just looking at the sky, eventually I did see it come in. Now at this point, I was just waiting for the encounter to appear, and then once it did, I got my orbit. And at this point, it really didn't matter where in the orbit I was going to be, since I was going so fast, I was going to fly way past it. So I had to kill basically all of my speed in order to get an orbit around Duna. 
and eventually here I did end up circularizing the orbit and I was captured by Duna. Now I shrunk it down quite a bit until eventually I got pretty close to the surface and there I actually got an accidental encounter with its moon, which is pretty common because its moon is really annoying, it's pretty massive and it's pretty close. But once I ended up getting it to the point where I was going to be flying pretty close to Duna, I just sort of had to wait until I eventually got around to the other side. And then I just warped all the way to the periapsis, which again is the closest point. And I was pointed retrograde, which is the opposite direction of my velocity. And I was trying to kill it so that I would shrink my orbit like this. And I pretty much circularized it. And you can see I have very little fuel left. I was hoping it would be enough just to be able to land, uh, but there was actually a pretty good chance it wasn't going to be. So I ended up warping till I was just about where the day and night ended up meeting. And then I started burning retrograde once again to hopefully kill my orbit so that I'd be able to fall onto the surface of Duna. And I ended up getting that here, and it actually seemed to be working out fine. So in order to prep for a landing, I shrunk down the solar panels so that they wouldn't end up getting dragged in the atmosphere, extended the landing feet, which I didn't really need to do now, but I figured it'd probably be good, because if I forgot, that's kind of a problem. And I also told my rocket to face retrograde, which, again, the opposite direction of my travel, so that once I'm landing, I'll be straight up and down. And I took the opportunity too to deploy all the parachutes. They don't do anything yet, they only deploy once they get to this certain height, but basically I'm just giving them the authority to deploy whenever they get to the right height. And so began the fall. I had lost all of my fuel at this point, so I was trusting the parachutes to kill all of my speed. You'll notice I'm going like 700 something meters per second, and I was actually really concerned about that, but the parachutes still deployed and killed a bunch of my speed. I was shocked that the parachutes didn't end up just ripping off immediately. I guess the atmosphere is thin enough I could get away with this. If I tried to do this on Kerbin, no chance. I, I, at least I think there'd be no chance. And finally I got low enough that the high altitude chutes fully deployed and the low altitude chutes uh, mostly deployed and then finally fully deployed here. And now I'm going 10 meters per second, so there's basically no chance of anything going wrong. And I just warped all the way to the ground. So I turned on all my lights, really no reason to do that, but just makes it a little easier to see. And began landing and realized I was on a mountain. And unfortunately my spacecraft tipped over. Now nothing broke, so it was fine. But it's just a little unfortunate because it would have been nice to have it standing up. This presented some bigger issues, like now I couldn't get Jeb out of the spacecraft because the door was now blocked by the ground. So I had to play some games with the solar panels to lift up the spacecraft in order to get him to be able to get out. But once I ended up getting it up, I let him get off and he was walking around. Now my spacecraft was slowly sliding towards a big pit. And that was a little worrying, so I basically sent Jeb to just watch that. Now, I wasn't great at controlling his rockets, and the jetpack's actually much harder to control than I would have thought. But I sent him to the bottom, and then eventually the spacecraft got there too, and the solar panels ended up just shattering. So I took the opportunity while he was out to plant the flag, and I would have loved to put him back in the spacecraft, but the door was still blocked. So he used to sort of stuck out there, unfortunately. Now, I also found this bug where Jeb was just sort of floating on the air for no reason. I really can't explain this one, and when he jumped, he ended up just sort of jumping on nothing. So guys, thanks for watching. Definitely want to do some more Kerbal in the future. I'm not sure exactly what, definitely want to make some weird spacecrafts, but to get started since literally I had not played in years, I just wanted to do something pretty simple. So if you have any questions or comments, feel free to ask below, and until next time.